Hello everybody, I am Wallace. Today I want to share with you the story of Diablo 2, and I've made an important point in including every bit of valuable lore hidden in NPC's dialogue that are too often skipped. And when we put all of those little pieces of stories together, Diablo 2 becomes a legend not to be forgotten. Everything starts as we are introduced to Marius, who acts as the narrator of the story. We don't know much about this old man other than he was in the rogue's citadel when it was first invaded by the army of hell. He tried to flee into the mountains, past the eastern gates, but the evil that raided the citadel unfortunately followed the same route. Marius was sure that the dark wanderer was haunted by some demon, and at some point he saw him completely lose control, releasing the wrath of hell in the end. Were these the demons from my dream or were they born within the wonder? After he came back to him, everyone was dead. Except for Marius, who then decided to follow a route that was about to change his life forever. Why did I follow him? I don't know. Why do things happen as they do in dreams? All I know is that when he beckoned, I had to follow him. And from that moment, we traveled together east. Always into the east. From now on we will follow the path of our new hero, the so-called Sorceress, as she start our adventure in the corrupted land of the Eastern Kanduras. We were greeted by the famous Warriv, the traveling merchant. He informed us that there had been a tragedy in the town of Tristram, the town of Diablo 1. Rumors say that Diablo was free and traveled in sanctuary once more. In addition to that, Warriv told us that a dark wanderer traveled the route near the camp not so long ago, heading to the east. Shortly after his passage, Evil took roots in the land and creatures began ravaging the country. The rogue monastery's gates were closed, blocking the only passage to the east. Heading to Akara, the high priestess of the Sisterhood of the Sightless Eye, she told us that the monster that took the control of their beloved citadel is no other than Endoriel, a lesser evil far from her home. She cursed many of the rogue and turned them against the Sisterhood. Now there were just a few of them left to defend the tiny little camp where they took refuge. Akara asked for our help to lift the curse and send back that demoness from where she came. But for the moment, there were more pressing matters. The rogue scout had spotted many creatures gathering in the den of evil, a nearby cave, and they needed to be taken care of, which we did. Right after this little quest, Cassia, the commander of the rogue, asked us to kill one of her ancient captains, Blood Raven. She was one of the first rogue to be corrupted by Andariel. Akara even mentioned that Blood Raven had found the Lord of Terror himself in the catacombs beneath Tristram, and that's why she is often referred to be the rogue you can play in Diablo 1, which would totally make sense. She would have brought back an evil influence from her fight against Diablo, and was never quite the same after. At this moment, she was raising dead rogues as zombies in the monastery graveyard, and that was not really nice of her. At least, Geed won't have to deal with those rogues anymore. Some of those gals weren't so nice the first time around. At this point in the story, Akara seemed a bit overwhelmed by the situation with Andariel. So she tasked us to head to the old Tristram in order to rescue the card Kane, if he was still alive. Kane was the only Aradrim sage around and his knowledge and wisdom would definitely be handy. Tristram being too far to journey by foot though, we first needed to recover the rune in the bark of the old tree of Inephus, which holds the key to open a portal to the old town. This ancient tree has an aura of magic about it. And within the circle of Cairn Stone in Stonyfield, we finally opened the gate. Tristram was a mess. The ancient blacksmith, Griswold, was turned into an undead. Wirt, the honest traitor, was left dead on the grass, and the town was burning red. Fortunately for us, Kane was still alive and apparently hadn't gone mad. Deckard Kane, get to the rogue camp. Back to the rogue camp, the last representative of the Horadrim confirmed our greatest fear. Diablo, the Lord of Terror, was back from the grave. 
Kane also said that not so long ago, when Diablo was slain beneath Tristram, a great celebration that lasted several days took place, and as a week passed after that, the warrior that killed Diablo became distant, slowly falling into dark depression. He started waking up at night, screaming about something to the east. The men finally left Tristram, and it didn't take long that demons started attacking the old town. In the end, King thought that the hero of Tristram was the dark wanderer that passes near the rogue camp, and that Diablo had taken possession of him. This can be easily explained by the last scene in Diablo 1. After the hero killed the Lord of Terror, he took his soul stone and deliberately stabbed himself in the face with it in an attempt to contain Diablo within his own body. We now understand that it was a foolish decision, as no mortal can easily handle a prime evil by himself, except maybe for our my sorceress but that still needs to be proven. Our next step led us in the Black March, where we came across an ancient runed tower, rising from the ground like the remnant of an ancient kingdom. This tower once belonged to the Countess, an evil being who had been accused of many cruel deeds during her lifespan. Her reign headed when she was buried alive after she batted in the rejuvenating blood of her hundred virgin. It is said that her fortune was divided amongst the clergy, but some say that more remains, buried deep in the roots of the tower. Despite the warning of the townsfolk, we delve into the haunted tower, killed the Countess and stole the remaining treasure. Our pockets now fully loaded, one last step remained, finding Endoriel within the monastery. Oh, the monastery. On our way we stumble on the Horadric Malice, an item of great values for Charcy. This item was forged and enchanted 260 years ago during the Sin War by the Horadric mages. On that note, Cain told us more about the Horadrim. They were an ancient confederation of mage clans who vowed to bind the three prime evils, Mephisto, Diablo and Baal, for eternity. To help them in their tasks, the Archangel Tyriel gave them the Soul Stones, but we now know that these holy artifacts couldn't contain Diablo's power. As for his brothers, we didn't know yet if the Soul Stones worked as intended. When the Horadrim's order finally dissolved, the Malice was given to the Sisterhood to help protect the way to the East. This path is now protected by Andoriel, the Demon Queen, but why? According to the ancient Horadric texts, Andoriel and the other lesser evils once team up and manage to banish the prime evils from hell and send them to the mortal realm. The Horadrim finally bound them within the Soul Stone, but only after they cause untold anguish and suffering to this world. The presence of Andoriel in the monastery, guarding the path to the Hiss on the behalf of Diablo, could mean that the three brothers once again led the army of hell, and Cain thought that the pyrophobic queen had probably joined Diablo to win his favor and gain power within the unholy hierarchy. We finally found the catacombs and deep within its corridors, our sorceress put an end to Andoriel's miserable life, lifting the curse on the rogues and opening the path to the east. That also granted us the privilege to become friends with Cassia, something I thought was impossible. Farewell, my friend. And it was with Warriv and Cain that Diablo's hunt continued. The caravan is prepared. We may now journey eastward to loot Golain. They traveled east, far to the east, and at some point Marius finally found some sleep, but the terrific dreams they experienced came back, only the memories did not belong to him. He saw the great Orodric mage tell Rasha as he and his comrades attempt to imprison Baal, the Lord of Destruction, within his sacred soul stone. But they failed. Only then did Talrasha volunteer to contain Baal within his own body, completing the prison. To do so, he asked his brother to bind him in a tomb, buried under the sand, where he vowed to fight the Lord of Destruction for eternity. We set out with the dawn. And the next morning they headed towards the great port city of Lugolain, shining jewel of the east, and a great place to smoke Norland weed, according to Geed. It is not clear how far we were behind the duo, but we followed the same route and we soon got in front of the city's lord, Jeren. He mentioned that his city has been under siege by some evil fiend since a dark wanderer came by, a story that seemed to repeat itself here. 
The cloaked man was looking for the lost tomb of Tal Russia, but Jiren couldn't help him much. The only thing he knew was rumors of its location to be far out in the desert. Soon after this meeting, the town was closed as creatures outside were becoming too dangerous and ships were moored. In addition to that, the entrance to the royal palace was restricted as things were a bit messy there, as Jiren said. It appeared that our feet in the west preceded us and Hatma, the owner of the public house, quickly asked for our help. She seeks revenge over a creature that had been killing many citizens of Lugolain, including his son and husband. That creature was said to be hiding in the sewers and having a special taste for human flesh. The leader of the mercenary, Grace, recently hired by Jiren to predict the town, had found some dead citizens washed out of the sewers, missing limbs or head, and even Meshift saw a human arm floating around his boat. And the most terrifying thing in all of that is that the bodies found had all been skinned. Going down the sewers blind as a mole didn't seem wise, so we first seek advice from Drognan the mage and Farah, a merchant who was once trained as a paladin of Zakarum. They both agreed that the creature would be Radamin the Fallen. They also said that Oradrims used to mummify the corpse of their highest mages, infusing them with spells in order for them to protect their own tombs in which they were not supposed to leave. Some funeral priests even tried to alter the mummies using animal parts with the goal of augmenting their powers. I don't know if that information helped or not, but I ventured into those filthy tunnels and managed to kill what was already dead. With the information that my sorcerers brought back, Drodin concluded that Radamant would have been tasked to revive his own mummified corpse using living flesh, and he believed it would have taken an incredible power to alter the undead mind. Perhaps an evil being was behind all that. In addition to helping the townsfolk sleep easier, our hero brought something back from the sewers, an ancient Orodric scroll. It reveals that after the Orodric mages bind Baal within Tal Russia, they magically sealed off his burial chamber so that no mortal could find or reach it. They planned a way to reopen the chamber if needed though, with the help of powerful Orodric staves, and after nearly losing one to the hand of a rogue sorcerer, they divided all their staff into a wooden shaft in the middle of piece and hid them all. In order to reunite them, a Horodric cube would be needed. And so we started the treasure hunt in the desert. Sounds fun. Our crafty sorcerers first found the cube in the halls of the dead, and soon after the Staff of Kings in the Magat Lair, a somewhat narrow place to explore. And while she was searching for the headpiece, a sudden sun eclipse hit the desert. Jordan quickly spotted the work of the Claw Vipers here and directed us toward their temple beneath the desert sand. And amongst all the scared citizens, only Mischief saw some good news here. This permanent darkness is very unsettling. Hmm. It would make navigation by stars easier for me, though. Fortunately, the giant snake's lair was easily spotted, as it was illuminated by big far torches, and we soon found a device that was turning the sun black, a magical altar protected by fang skin. Breaking it was the only way to bring the light back, and even if those venomous snakes were hard to deal with, our efforts pays off in the end as they happened to own a nice artifact, the amulet of the viper, the headpiece we were looking for. The Orodric staff was able to be restored, and one last step remained, finding the location of Talrasha's tomb. On that subject I seek once more the help of Drugnan. His research revealed that the great Vizdurai summoner, Horazan, might know where to find a tomb. His story goes back to nearly 1000 years ago when the powerful spellcaster became one of the highest mages in the Vizdurai clan. He mostly uses his knowledge to summon and control demons from hell, and eventually he came to fear that the lords of hell would punish him for enslaving their peers, and the summoner then created himself an arcane sanctuary, a place he thought would not only protect him from hell's vengeance, but negate the effect of time on his body, allowing him to live and study for eternity. Throughout the time, Orazun would have crafted many scrying devices to keep a close eye on the outside world, and Drognan is certain that he carefully studied and recorded everything related to the imprisonment of Baal and the location of Tal Rasha's tomb. Now even if many doubts that Orazun was still alive, his sanctuary might still hold the information we seek. Now how does one find what has been built to stay hidden? To that poetic question, Jiren happened to know the answer. So we went to see him and learn more than we expected. He said that when the trouble began in Lugolain, he allowed the Diarum Guild girls to take refuge in his palace and locked the place down so that his guard could protect them easier. The weird thing was that from that moment, no one in town never heard or saw the girls anymore. Some even thought that he kept the girl for interesting matters. But in the end, Jiren was honest. He said his intention had always been to keep the girls safe. 
but one night Screamy called up the stairwells. The guards rushed to help the girl, but it was too late. The poor ladies were already being slaughtered by a spawn demon that came from a mysterious rift. The guards tried as hard as they could, but they didn't manage to push the evil back and from that moment, they continuously lost ground to the demons. The lower levels of the palace were lost and that was the reason why Jiren hired Grey and his men to protect the town. On top of that, we learned that the Arcane Sanctuary was believed to be built in Lugolain, and the entrance was thought to be under Jiren's palace, as this place was once an ancient Vizdrai fortress. With those two elements put together, chances were that the demons Jiren's guard were fighting would have come straight out of the Arcane Sanctuary, and it would have meant that the Yarazan Sanctuary was breached. That was a lot of speculation, and we needed answers fast. So our sorcerers delved into the palace cellar to confirm the theories, found the rift, and stepped through it. This place actually distorts reality. Fascinating. The Horizon Sanctuary was indeed fascinating, a flying fortress lost in space and time. But as Kane predicted, it definitely had been breached. It took quite a while to explore all the hallways, and in one corner of the map, we got surprised by a voice, laughing in the void. <laughs> If you come back in town at this exact moment, before killing the summoner, you will learn that the person we saw in a robe was an imposter in a resin suit. In order to understand what happened there and who this fake summoner is, we will need to go back in time. Almost a year ago, one of Drognan Vizdra's comrades, who was presumed dead after a fight with Diablo and Tristram, came to Lugolain. The mage had a special interest in the history of the palace, so Jiren kindly gave him a tour and upon the sight of an ancient seal over a passageway in the cellar, the mage became very agitated. He asked for and was allowed some time alone to study the seal, and Jiren saw him leave the town shortly after this, and nobody ever saw the mage again. When we came back to describe the appearance of the summoner we just saw, most of the townsfolk agreed that it sounded just like the eastern mage who had visited Jiren. Kane also confirmed that this mage was present in Tristram when the town was in war against Diablo. He might have found a way to enter the sanctuary and take Arazin's place, or there's also a possibility that the spirit of Arazin would have taken possession of him. His fullness might be the act of Diablo, though, as only darkness surrounds those who have confronted the prime evil. Remember, the same thing happened with Blood Raven. Vizdra or not, we put it an end to his tortured existence. Fortunately, Arazin's journal was intact and it revealed the location of the true tomb of Talrasha. The journal also explained that long ago, the proud order of the Haradrim pursued the true prime evil across the Empire of the East and even in the West. When the presumed brother vanquished, the mage's fellowship began to dissipate and slowly started abandoning their sacred charge to guard the tree soulstone. In the end, their brotherhood collapsed, leaving the evil unattended. Those Haradrims, as strong as they were, didn't really quite make it in the end, and the burden they once carried fell on our shoulders. Closing back the book opened a secret portal that led to the canyon of Magi, and it was there, far out in the arid land, that our sorceress finally found Talrasha's tomb. Kane had spoken of a circle of seven symbols, and we found it. The Oradric staff we had rebuilt the work, and the passage to the burial chamber was opened once more. As expected, the room was protected. Duriel, and Daryl's twin, kindly welcomed us with his claw, and let me tell you, this fast beast was not easy to lay down. Surprisingly, it was Tyrael and not Diablo that was waiting for us. The Archangel of Justice said he tried to prevent Diablo from freeing his brother Bell, but failed. And here's what happened. We're brought back in time as Maris and the Dark Wanderer found Talrasha's tomb. And as they were getting deeper in it, Mars started to notice that the Wanderer was gaining in strength. They end up in the burial chamber and the Wanderer, or should I say Diablo, rushes to quickly free his brother Bell. He gets stopped, though, by an angelic being. The beast contained herein shall not be set free, not even by you. Tyrell and Diablo started to fight, and Marius, following a voice, slowly started to cross the bridge as the whisper in the dark was begging for help. <laughs> and it is by the end of an old mortal man that one of the greatest evil was freed that day. Just ensure the doom of this world. You cannot even begin to imagine what you've set in motion this day. Go to the Temple of Light in the eastern city of Karas. There you will find the gate to hell opened before you. You must find the courage to step through that gate, Maris. Take the stone you hold to the Hellforge, where it will be destroyed. Now run. Take the stone and run!
He ran, in the same direction that Diablo and Bell took next, the Zacharum Temple in Curas. And present there was their eldest brother, Mephisto, the Lord of Hatred, and they wished to free him. Due to his fight against Diablo, Tyrell was too weak to pursue his mission, so he asked us to take his place and prevent the prime evil from uniting. Our failure would mean the doom of the mortal world. Before we left Luke Galane, Cain brought to our attention that the forces of heaven usually do not interfere so directly with men's destiny, but Tyrell was said to act of his own volition. Did he think mortal too weak to defend themselves? Or did he see more threat than the consensus of heaven? Nobody knows. But in contrast to the action of hell, who always seemed to be directed toward destruction, heaven's motive had always stayed secret. And now that Baal had consumed Talrasha's mind, who knew what he could do with the Horadrim's knowledge at hand? At this moment, however, all that matters was that Lou Golin was safe. Our hero bid farewell to the villagers, and now that Mischief was once again allowed to take the sea, we set sail in the direction of Kurast, the ancient capital of Kajistan, on the eastern coast of the Twin Seas. It was in a dark and creepy place that we docked Mischief's boat, and Rutley, a sorcerer's skill in middle work, gave us some information concerning the latest event in Kurast. Mephisto had gained more strength and follower than we thought. The only populace left alive and uncorrupted was here, in the dockside, and the area was protected by a magical warding that might not last forever. In addition to that, the children of Zakarum, also known as the Warrior of Light, had turned to the dark side and they had concentrated their forces in the temple city of Travinkle, deep within the jungle. The once glorious land where Mischief was born and raised was now only ruins and despair. Without awaiting further instruction, we started our hunt for Mephisto and quickly, our sorceress found an interesting jade figurine, which we brought back in exchange with Mischief for a golden bird he had in his possession. It appeared that Mischief was holding quite an artifact without even knowing it. The golden bird was actually holding the ashes of a powerful sage named Kuile, who was rumored to have brewed a potion of immortality. Ironically, he was murdered before the elixir took effect and his apprentice decided to burn his body hoping to derive benefits from his ashes. But they end up losing the dust and they all died old and mad. With those hashes now retrieved, Alcar, the curast alchemist, managed to make a potion from it, and yes, we drank it. Who would spit on 23 life points? It is only after this cocktail that King told us what he knew about Mephisto's prison. The Lord of Hatred had been imprisoned by the Horadrim inside the Garden Tower in Travincol. It is no coincidence that the Zacharums were protecting this exact area. To open the prison, we first needed to destroy the Compealing Orb, an artifact that Mephisto was using to control the Zacharum priest. And the only way to destroy it was with an ancient flail imbued with the spirit of Kalim, the Quihigan of the High Council of Zacharum. He had been the only priest that Mephisto had never been able to corrupt, and because of that, he was killed and dismembered. His remains scattered across the kingdom, and the corrupted priest Sankikur finally took Kalim's place as the leader of the Zacharum. So the goal was to find Kalim's art, brain, and eye, and transmute them all with Kalim's flail to create the only weapon able to destroy the orb. Nothing more simple. And because it was not enough, Rutley also asked us to recover an ancient Skatsimi blade called the Gibnin. The enchanted dagger would have the power to strengthen the magical barrier around the docks, and Hormus, who was believed to be a member of the Tahan Mage clan, would be able to use it as his clan's studies were focused on Skatsimi right. With our grocery list in our pocket, we ventured back into the jungle, this time with more specific things to do. We found Kalim's eye first, kept in a treasure chest in the spider cavern within the spider forest. And soon after, deep within the flare jungle, we walk into a small flare's encampment where stood the Gibnin on a rustic altar. We killed the fanatic ratman that was protecting the blade and brought it back to Ormus, that once again used his powers to protect the innocent from the shadow. I mean, that's how he said it. Continuing our jungle trip, we got our hands on Kalim's brain in the most dangerous place in Sanctuary, the flare dungeon. Damn do I eat those tiny little monsters! But fortunately, we had teleport and managed to get out of there quickly. We barely had the time to take back our breath that Alcor asked us to retrieve another artifact. Looks like we were not busy enough saving the world. Anyway, he was looking for a book written by Alam Eason, another ancient sage who studied Skatsimi's magic and the effect of the prime evil on the mortal man. The black book was lost to the children of Zakarum and was said to contain the knowledge of the old Skatsim religion. An interesting thing here is that Natalia, a member of the Kral Harsek secret order, mentioned that his order's code was based on many passages of this book. Knowing our order sworn to hunt down corrupted sorcerers, it felt like Lam Eason's book quest might finally be useful to complete. 
Ho! Oh, and she also mentioned that his order was keeping an eye over Hormus for many years. This guy is definitely a mystery. Our next stop was the city of Kurast, in which many runed temples rise from the ground. The Black Book was in one of those temples called Runed Temple, and it was well protected as expected. It sure was a tough fight for our little sorceress in training, but we did not come back empty-handed. At this moment in the game, if we bring back Lam Eason's book to Alcor, many NPCs' dialogue will change for the future quest and it will be way more interesting story-wise. So that quest done, the only remaining Kalim's body part to find was his art, which was in the sewers being cuirassed. And with the three body parts in our inventory, we headed to the Travincol. There we found the High Council of Zacharum, who was once a council of pious men devoted to fighting the prime evil. Things had changed though, and we only found fanatics who deserve only death. Killing those powerful priests was hard. Mephisto certainly had chosen his protectors wisely. Unfortunately, Sankiker was not there, but still, the execution of the High Council lifted the portion of the curse that was tormenting the jungle, as per what Ms. Shift reported. With the four regions at hand, Kalim's will was brought to life within the cube, and the compelling orb was shattered under his wrath, opening the path to Mephisto's lair. In the meantime, Ashira reported that a few of his iron wolves that were scouting near the temple city encountered two clothed men who attacked them with overfying power. At this point, there was no doubt upon their identity. Diablo and Bell were closer than we thought. What the old Rodrum feared the most was about to happen. We then learned the reason why Sankikur was not in Travincol, as he would be the man who embodied Mephisto and according to Ormus, that would make him the most powerful mortal in the world. Killing that demon was not going to be an easy task. The durance of eight was well guarded, and we finally reached our goal on the third floor. You're too late. <laughs> Indeed, we were too late. I did as you told me, Tyriel. I found the temple of the Zakarum. In the deepest recesses of the temple, I found a dark gathering. My companion, the Wanderer, Talrasha, and a great evil who could only be the Lord of Hatred himself, Mephisto. I heard a voice that, like a thousand needles in my heart. The three were there, and Mephisto had prepared the Infernal Gate. With the power of the primevals united, they opened the way to hell. Diablo, the Lord of Terror, took once again his true form and walked back from where he came from. Arise, Diablo, Lord of Terror. You will harm Diablo, return Diablo, send forth your terror into hell. That's why we were too late. But that didn't stop us from killing Mephisto at this point. At least one of them will no longer be a trap. Before our sorceress stepped blindly into this infernal gate, she came back to town and learned that Cain suspected Bell to have followed his brother in hell. We had no other choice. We needed to follow them and kill the Lord of Terror before all was lost. We got transported in what looked like an outpost, standing on a rock in the middle of the void. But as opposed to what we thought, we were not in hell, not yet. And once more, Cain shared his knowledge with us. We appeared to be in the Pandemonium Fortress, a place that stands between heaven and hell. Terra had it that this was the last bastion of heaven's power before the gates of the burning hell. A heaven's outpost that has seen many battles between the demon and the champion of the light, in which many were mortal, like us. Only two of those champions seemed to live there though, Jamala and Halbu, and they were not really talkative. There was no time to waste looking at this fortress architecture though, as Diablo was gathering his demonic forces and he was getting stronger every second. The first mission of our sorceress here was to destroy Mephisto's soul stone, and to do so, we needed to find the Elf Forge and break the corrupted stone with what Cain referred to as the Hammer. Doing that would prevent Mephisto from ever manifesting in this world again. As for Tyrell, he was forbidden to aid us directly as this was to be the hour of mortal men's triumph. You know, the angel and their reasoning. 
On top of not helping us, he got the nerve to ask us to kill who used to be his most trusted lieutenant, Ijual the Fallen. Long ago, he was captured by the Prime Evils after he foolishly assaulted their fiery Elforge. The perverse power of the demons managed to twist the Archangel's soul, and he was forced to betray his own kind and give up Evan's most guarded secrets. For a time, he became a fallen angel trusted neither by Evan or Hell, and for his transgression, usual spirit was bound to the body of a terrible creature, summoned from the Abyss. His dark and tortured soul had been trapped in this forsaken realms for many ages now, and Terrell decided that he had suffered long enough. So we gathered our potion, sharpened our blade and took the first step on the stairway to Hell. But that place was not meant for mortals. Great Demon's Lord and Doom Knight were roaming everywhere, and tortured souls were trapped waiting for salvation. We soon reached the plane of despair and finally came face to face with Israel, and on that, Tyrell was right. Even in this form, the tortured Archangel still possesses great power and strength. Not enough to beat our majestic sorceress, though. And in the end, Israel's spirit was freed. Kirill was a fool to have trusted me. You see, it was I who told Diablo and his brothers about the Soul Stones and how to corrupt them. It was I who helped the Prime Evils mastermind their own exile to your world. The plan we set in motion so long ago cannot be stopped by any mortal agency. Hell itself is poised to spill forth into your world like a tidal wave of blood and nightmares. You and all your kind are doomed. With only four sentences, Israel revealed more than everything we've learned so far in the story. We don't know for sure if Israel betrayed Tyrell before or after he got corrupted by the Prime Evils, but it was him who gave Tyrell the idea of using the Soul Stone against the Three Brothers. And with Israel's help, they then managed to corrupt the Soul Stone so that as long as those artifacts were intact, the Prime Evil would be immortal in this realm. And the whole thing we've learned in Act 1 about Andoriel and the Lesser Evils, who overthrew the Prime Evils and banished them in the mortal realm, was all planned by Mephisto, Diablo and Baal from the beginning. According to Tyrell, their goal was to turn the mortal world into a permanent outpost for the army of hell. A well-crafted plan if you ask me, but it was about time that we showed them who was really immortal. We continued our route across the fiery river of flames and found the elf forge and his blacksmith, Hephaesto the Armorer. This demon had certainly been toughened by all these years of working in his demonic anvil, and his skin, hard as iron, took us quite a while to pierce. The armorer finally dropped his famous hammer, and with it, we smash what was left of Mephisto's soul, banishing him from this world once and for all. With the eldest brother dead, the next on our list was Diablo, the Lord of Terror, and this time his soul stone shall not slip through our hands. We reached the verge of the River of Flame and an angel named Adriel informed us that within Diablo's sanctum lies five hidden seal, and it is only by opening all of them that the final battle shall begin. And so we step into the Chaos Sanctuary, a well-deserved name for a place so chaotic. There, our sorceress started to feel that the whole army of hell was standing between her and Diablo, and no breach was visible. But one spell after another, she slowly pushes through the demon's horde, destroying them one by one, and once the fifth seal got lit, the entire realm started to shake. Diablo had arrived, and this lizard was not there for a cup of tea. A blazing fight started between the prime evil and the sorceress, Flames emerge from both sides, slashing, burning, and it all end up in the sweet smell of roasted demonic meat. Another great evil was slain that day, and Diablo's soul went back to his stone. When we came back to town to mend our wounds, Tyrell confirmed that Diablo's soul stone was destroyed. But this was not the end. As opposed to what Cain first thought, Bell had not followed his brother in hell. Instead, he stayed behind and started building an army of elish minions with only one purpose, finding the world stone, the very sources behind the power of all the soul stone. The demons had already fought their way into the barbarian homelands, heading for the summit of Mount Ariat, the place where the world stone was resting for many years, an information that Bell had somehow managed to discover. And this was to be our next destination. I heard later that he was defeated. And that the Soul Stone were destroyed in Hellforge. All 
except one. The poor Marius was hopelessly lying in this abandoned prison, relating his tragic story to whom he thought was Tyrael. He explained that he didn't find the courage to enter the infernal gate back in Mephisto's lair, and so he was still carrying Bell's soul stones. At his request, he handed the corrupted artifact to Tyrael, only to learn that the hooded man in front of him was in fact. Bell, now I think you shall have your reward. With his soul stone back, Bell reached the gates of Sesheron with a gigantic army, and once again he had total control of his dark power, and no man shall no more be allowed to stand in his path, no matter what he offered. <laughs> well, it seems your terms are not acceptable. <laughs> the great city of Sesheron was lost within a day. And so it was in the city of Aragath, the last bastion of order on the slopes of Mount Ariat, that Tyrell's portal led us. A small town inhabited by hardy barbarians, proudly guarding their sacred mountains. To the great surprise of Cain, the place seemed untouched by Baal's corruption, which in its own was an exploit. We first met Mala, an old lady that once tried the ways of the sorceress, but her powers never developed beyond the simplest of spells, so she became a healer, using herbs and potions to take care of the wounded. After a warm welcome, she told us that Aragat was under siege for a while now, and despite the effort of Qualcake and his men-at-arms, Bell's minions were gaining ground every passing hour. It was strange, as the people of Aragat knew Bell was searching for something in the mountains, but they apparently were not aware that he was looking for the Worldstone. I mean, it would have been the least we could have done to tell them. Anyway, in an attempt to protect the city, all the elders of Aragat, except Nelatak, sacrificed themselves to place a protective ward around the town. But that was not before nearly a third of their warriors were lost. Mala warned us though, our presence here was not appreciated by all the townsfolk, particularly this Nell attack. Barbarians were proud people and strangers were not easily accepted in the north. Still, we needed more information regarding Baal, so we first went to see Qualcake as if there was to be someone who knew more about what was happening outside the city's gate, it would be him. He said that the protective ward was doing his job for the moment, but Bell's siege was still making havoc in the land. Most of his men were dead by now, and others were trapped in the mountain passes. We then went to speak to Nelatak the Elder, and he did not greet us kindly. He accused us of being there only to loot the bodies of the fallen warriors and to see glory through the battlefield. He also happened to be extremely confident of their future victory over Bell, and even criticized Qualcake of having blindly sent the barbarians to their death. There was definitely something wrong with this grumpy character. The fourth and final citizen that agreed to speak to us was Larzert the Armorer, descendant from a great line of Aragat's finest craftsmen and a blacksmith so talented, according to Cain, that even the Horadrim would have loved to work with him. But that guy, like many barbarians here, wanted some proof of our abilities, and so he asked us to get to the battlefield and destroy Shank the Overseer, one of the most vicious generals in Bale's army. That ruthless taskmaker was lashing his own minions into suicidal frenzies, and was also in charge of the infernal catapults that were spreading hell outside Aragath. A nice mission to gain the trust of these folks. We stepped out of town in bloody foothills, a land covered in barbarian's blood, and slowly fought our way through Shank with the help of Qualcake's men, destroying what we could of Bell's force along the way. Our sorceress found the general with his squad of enslaved monsters, and crushed them in no time, leaving only bones on the ground. And where many failed, we succeed. And maybe now Mala would finally be able to have a break from seeing so many heroes come back and face death in front of her. The death of her own son, Banuk, was more than enough for her to handle anyway. 
He was an archer and was impaled on demon spear not so long ago. The wound was such that even Mala acknowledged that quick death was a blessing. That victory earned us the respect of many citizens that day, except for Nil attack, but no surprise here. And Larzak, as a token of his gratitude, said he would craft sockets into an item of our choice, a handy gift for battles to come. As our reputation was slowly building up, Qualcake asked us to go further into the mountains. Some of his men were kept prisoners and he was worried about what happened to them. Others, though, were fortunate enough to escape and reported that Bell was keeping their comrades in the highlands at Plateaus, using the barbarians' barricade and towers for their own sake. We teleported through the tiny defenses of Bale's army and managed to find 15 soldiers trapped behind smalls and frail wood barriers. As a reward for saving them, Quolke gave us some low-level runes and allowed us to hire the same soldier that we just saved to bring him back to the battlefield. A reward for us, but perhaps not for those men. That second quest done, the people of Aragat really started to like us. Larjak even admitted that he was starting to believe all the tales that Cain had told him concerning our deeds in the southern kingdoms. As for Nelatak, he wasn't that impressed and it felt like he was not valuing the barbarian's life that much. So, you've brought the lost sheep home to the shepherd. Well done. At least he did not insult our sorceress this time. Around that moment, we learned an interesting legend from Larzak. He said that the top of Mount Ariat was guarded by the spirit of his ancestor. His people were forbidden to climb it and of all the foreign travelers that had made an attempt, none ever returned. This was interesting because when we first arrived in this Nordic country, Ken had mentioned that the true nature of Mount Ariat was a mystery for many users of the magical art and that it was a nexus of an unfathomable magic. He also mentioned that Tyrell himself had watched over the guardians of Ariat throughout history, even if for the moment we had not seen the angel for a while. That summit was still far though and our help was required somewhere else. This time it was our new friend Mala that seeked assistance on a somewhat delicate quest. She was worried for a girl named Anya, a young alchemist and the daughter of the DC's Oust, one of the wisest Aragat's elder. One night before we arrived in town, Mala overheard Anya and Nilatak arguing about Anya's father's death. The next morning, the girl was gone, and she had been missing since then. Mala suspected Nelatak to be at the root of her disappearance, and advised to not believe anything coming out of his mouth. Still, we went to hear his version of the story. Well, I'll tell you what really happened. Anya came to me for guidance, after receiving a vision that her mother and younger brother were trapped in the lands beyond the ice caves. She had decided to go rescue them. I told her that her quest was a foolish one and that she would be safer staying within the city walls. However, she is a willful girl and would not listen to me. The next morning she was gone. No one is more distraught than I over losing her. That dialogue sounded really hard in Nilatak's mouth, and on top of that, Nilatak was the only elder who managed to escape the demons and come back to Sanctuary safely. Since that day, Hanya and Nilatak haven't gotten along. Even Cain thought that Nailtech was speaking with a venomous tongue, pretending that the entire weight of this town rested upon his shoulders alone. Very odd indeed. We needed to uncover the truth, and so we started to track Anya in the area plateau, and then in the crystalline passage that was well protected by Trish Socket. At some point we started to run low on potions and came back to town only to learn that Nailtech was gone during our absence. We also learned that Anya was the only person besides Nailtech who had any real knowledge on Mount Ariat's secret so her fate might be more connected to our than what we thought. We came back in the caves and our sorceress eventually found a frozen river that directly led to Anya. She was weak but alive, trapped within a freezing curse, courtesy of Nelatak. Mala immediately prepared a potion to counter the curse and we managed to bring Anya back home. She would ward us with a permanent buff to our magic resistances and urge us to go talk to Anya. After thanking us for our help, she revealed what she knew about Nilatak's plan. Nilathak told me he struck a deal with Bale to protect Taragat. In exchange for the demon's mercy, the misguided fool plans to give Bale the relic of the ancients, our most holy totem. Doing so will allow Bale to enter Mount Ariat unchallenged by the ancients. I tried to stop Nilathak, but he imprisoned me in that icy tomb. Nilathak must be stopped before he dooms the whole world. As much as I would love to strangle the life out of him, I'm afraid I haven't the strength. You must go to his lair through this portal I've opened, kill him, and then bring back the relic of the ancients. Stop Nilathak from destroying what we have striven for eons to protect. 
Did the attack just wanted to protect the town? Maybe, but he had gone too far this time, and he, out of every soul in this city, should have known that no one can ever deal with a prime evil. The ancients, the only thing the barbarians believed could have stopped Baal, were about to be silenced by a simple amulet. Hatred started to grow in the heart of Aragat's citizen, and most of them only wanted revenge and blood. What's there to talk about? Kill Nilothok. What choice did we have? We stepped into Anya's portal. Nelatak Temple was a place ruled by anguish and pain, and in the deep recesses of the Hall of Vaut, we found the traitor. The so-called wise man only used cowardly spells against us, and in the end, like a witch at a stake, his soul got purged by fire. We then searched for it, but that damn Nelatak had already given the relic to Baal, a sad turn of events and a nice shortcut for Baal who will be able to skip the ancients. With the Elder's Council completely gone, someone needed to take their places and Anya was supposed to be the next in line for occupying this role after her father, but she doubted her shoulder was strong enough for that burden. Anya also told us that her father, Host, knew that the proud barbarians would eventually need help from the outside to deal with Bell's legion. His father also believed that this conflict would affect not only the north, but the entire world and that Mount Ariat was essential for the world's survival. As for Nelatak, she would never forgive his betrayal, but she said that she will try to learn from his mistakes. On our side, we were approaching the summit of Mount Ariat. Citizens said that the ancients were protecting the path so that no one on Wardy could pass. They were their ancestors, often even seen as their god. If we were to come back from that summit alive, we would become far more than a simple warrior for these people. The road to reach Ariat was long. We passed through many caves to exit through a hole that led into the frozen tundra. From there, we followed the edge of the mountain and stumbled on a well-crafted part of the wall with an opening. We had found the ancient's way, and our sources knew she was on the good track. In this labyrinth covered in snow and hunted by Baal's minion, we found a small stair that ended up straight on the area summit. A cold wind was blowing on the top of the world, and we saw the ancient trapped in rock and time. Kolik the protector wielding an albard, Madak the Guardian with his two axes and Talik the Defender, sword and shield in hands. We are the spirits of the Nephilim. Before you enter, enter, you must defeat us. That fight was tough and we had no other choice but to trick them, because fighting in melee against three barbarians was not a good idea. But we ended up victorious in their test of metal. The ancients then informed us that Baal was already inside the mountain, and that he had blocked Tyrell's spiritual prisons from entering the chamber of the Worldstone. So our worthy sorceress was left alone to stand against the Lord of Destruction, and she needed to stop Baal fast, before he gained total control of the sacred Worldstone. Because otherwise, he could shatter the boundaries between this world and the burning hells, unleashing an unstoppable horde of minions upon the mortal realm. The ancient made it clear, we must not fail. When we came back to town, we became the champion of Aragat. The proud barbarians had finally given us their blessing, and on the brink of the final battle, Cain made sure to remind us that Baal once possessed Tal Russia and will surely use his knowledge to his advantage. Our battles against Mephisto and Diablo will pale in comparison. To be honest, I prefer Mala's hype on the upcoming fight. You knew it would eventually come down to this. Kill Baal. Finish the game. And so we followed our advice and entered the Worldstone Keep, a well-crafted dungeon, paved with impressive corridors and rooms, wreaking Bell's corruption. We fought our way to the Throne of Destruction and we found him. Bell, standing on his throne like an imposter in our world. Yan Leech, wave by wave, is this casting army against us, but they didn't last long against the Sorceress, Slayer of Mephisto, Killer of Diablo and Survivor of the Ancients. When his minion of destruction died, this fool laughed and retreated in the Worldstone Chamber, where his fate was about to be set. That poor Lord of Destruction tried to protect himself with a mirror image, but no one tricks the Master of the Arcane that easily, and soon, Baal, the last of the prime evils, laughed for the last time. The last of the three has fallen. I am impressed, Mortals. You have overcome the greatest challenge this world has ever faced and defeated the last of the Prime Eagles. However, we are too late to save the Worldstone. Bale's destructive touch has corrupted it completely. 
Given enough time, the World Stone's energies will drain away, and the barriers between the worlds will shatter. The powers of Hell will flood into this sanctuary, and eradicate your people and everything you've labored to build. Therefore, I must destroy the corrupted World Stone before the powers of Hell take root. This act will change your world forever, with consequences even I cannot foresee. However, it is the only way to ensure mankind's survival. Go now, mortal. I have opened a portal that will lead you to safety. Before we stepped into this mysterious portal, our sorceress wanted to say goodbye to the friends she had made in Aragath. They were surprised by Tyrell's decision to destroy the Willstone, and Anya thought it was strange as prophecies said nothing about it. But in the end, they all agreed that it was probably for the best. May the light protect those people in the upcoming future, and at least for now, Sanctuary was saved. For one more time, we trusted Tyrael and walked in his portal. Now before I leave you, if you want to know what happened 5 years later, feel free to check out my video on the story of Diablo Immortal, and thanks for watching.